balance of my time. The gentleman yield back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening, uh, sharing some observations. It is, of course, always interesting to uh, have shared the floor with my good friend from Iowa, listening to his view of the universe, um, and uh, even uh, wincing a little bit as I hear him talk about uh, the uh, vilified public employee where they don't have to work as hard and they get lots more money than the private sector. Um, it's interesting that most independent studies suggest that for many categories uh, of public employees, uh, they are uh, not ab uh, above the market. Um, and it's sort of a fantasy land, I think, to have this disdain that was overwhelmingly rejected in Ohio when voters had a chance to put a stamp of approval on the fairly radical agenda of Governor Kasich, our former colleague here on the floor, on the, in the House of Representatives. Um, things, by the way, that Kasich and uh, his fellow traveler, uh, Governor Walker in Wisconsin, didn't talk about during the election. But turning their guns on public employees, voters in Ohio had a chance to give their verdict. And it's interesting that they overwhelmingly repudiated this notion, um, the lack of value of public employees, uh, the fact that they're slackers, uh, laggards, and that um, what they do is not worthy of public support. It wasn't the public health nurse, the firefighter, the teacher, the Marine, the person in the Navy that almost wrecked the economy. Um, many of these people are providing essential services. They are extraordinarily hardworking, and I'm happy to uh, invite my friend uh, from Iowa to come meet some very hardworking public employees uh, in Iowa and in Portland, Oregon. I think those generalizations are really unfortunate. Uh, it's uh, feeding uh, what we see in terms of the back and forth now. It's actually why there are people who've been motivated by the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. But I'm here tonight to deal with one very specific focus that I think needs some more attention, uh, and that has to do with the Postal Service. Um, you know, this is one of the areas today where people are zeroing in. You will hear some talk of folks that would feel much better if we just privatized the, so the Postal Service. Get out of the business. Uh, let the private sector pr provide this service uh, to uh, American households and commerce, and that we'll all be better off. Um, I think it's important to, for us to take a step back and look at some of the facts and look at some of the consequences. Um, you know, the United States Postal Service has a long and storied career. It's the second oldest federal agency. In fact, uh, the, pre, uh, the predecessor was actually created by the Continental Congress uh, and Ben Franklin was the postmaster there just as he was America's first Postal, postmaster. Uh, the Postal Service uh, is one of those activities that maybe some of my colleagues in the floor kind of overlooked when they had this great ceremony of reading the Constitution early in the session um, and then proceed to act as though they really aren't paying attention to the Constitution. Well, Article 1, Section 8, deriving the, the, the uh, explaining the Congress's powers, one of them is specifically to establish post offices and post roads. This was one of the unique institutions that helped bring America together. And it is still bringing America together today. It is, in fact, a vast and sprawling enterprise. Um, it employs more people um, than the entire auto industry in the United States, all what we used to call the big three. Uh, it's the second largest um, uh, non-military employer in this country. Uh, it has more installations than Walmart, Starbucks, 
and McDonald's put together, even though a number of them have been closed over the years. There's a reason uh, that we've made this investment for 235 years. There's a reason that there are uh, hundreds of thousands of dedicated employees. There is a reason why we have the broad sweep, uh, and that is this, this critical element of holding our country together. Uh, it is a backbone of commerce. We talked today about the economy of the future. E-commerce is a large and growing area. Um, it relies upon the postal service for uh, much of its efficiency. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's also a tremendous resource for the American public. I can drop in the mail uh, here in Washington, D.C., uh, before I get back to my home in Portland, um, I can drop my tax payment in the mail, 44 cents, with great confidence that that's going to arrive in a timely fashion and my bill will be paid. It is, I think, uh, interesting to look at the large national direct mail marketing industry that involves advertising and shipping worth billions of, year, of dollars a year, and again, is very important to a large number of Americans. In fact, some of the people that um, my colleagues would just turn the Postal Service over uh, to, uh, to uh, provide this uh, activity for the American public, like UPS, like FedEx, they actually rely on the Postal Service uh, for that last connection. There is actually a, an important partnership between these carriers and the Postal Service. Now, there is no doubt that if we completely privatized, turned it over, got out of the way, there would be some people who would benefit. People who live in very large cities, people who uh, are big businesses, that can negotiate certain types of services may actually see a little bit of rate reduction and they may be able to tailor the service to their needs. For them, the free market may provide a modest benefit, maybe. But the more important question is what would happen for the rest of America, the other 99%, particularly rural and small town America. Does anybody think that you would be able to send a letter from the Florida Keys to Nome, Alaska for 44 cents if all of a sudden government wasn't there providing that universal service, a mandate? I don't think so. We would also lose the personal touch that is so cherished by so many. We're hearing the outcries now. I, I hear it in Oregon where there are dozens of communities that are being considered to lose their postal service. Every rural and small town American community will feel that bite. Higher costs, less service, loss of job, loss of community identity, loss of connectivity. I would urge some of my colleagues to take the time to listen to rural postmasters and letter carriers about the role that they play in these far-flung parts of America. Uh, they are an important part of the local economy. Uh, it is a place where community uh, members gather. Um, there are opportunities for them to be in touch with loved ones and to be in touch via the magic of e-commerce. Um, they have far more choices and opportunities. Well. As we, before we jettison that element, I think it is important to consider how important that is to our national infrastructure. And that's what it is. It's not just the, arguably the largest source of non-military family wage jobs in America. Um, I don't think Walmart is necessarily the criterion that most people want uh, for uh, family wage jobs, for health care and retirement benefits. You know, I added, at, there was a time when that's what most people 
in the middle class, um, if not took it for granted, at least aspired to, and most of us growing up in post-World War II America saw that, even with people with limited education who are willing to work hard and, ta and, and be able to uh, follow through, uh, they had that. Well, uh, more and more the norm is that that is unusual. Um, I hope that, that it, we don't reach the point where we lower the standard. But two-thirds of a million family wage jobs with decent retirement security, with decent benefits, people who are providing an essential service uh, is, is, uh, is important, but it's the infrastructure that ties America together that I think is even more important. Now there's many things that are involved with the Postal Service that are hidden away, that people simply don't pay any attention to. Um, in part, I, I guess I would just uh, reference the exemplary service that is provided by most postal employees. In fact, uh, it is, um, uh, a, I, I know a number of postal employees who are highly regarded by the people on their route. Uh, they, they are recognized on their birthday. They get Christmas presents. Uh, people look forward to them. They rely on the service. They appreciate it. Um, Postal employees are involved with a wide range of activities in terms of helping people with their income tax reforms, food drives, uh, checking on housebound uh, friends and neighbors. When something is amiss, it's often a postal employee who understands it first. I think it is important that we take a deep breath and look at the service that's provided, look at what difference it makes for America, uh, look at what it means as an example of where we are going as a country. I think one of the items that uh, should be acknowledged is that this is the so-called crisis that we are facing is much like the summer's debt ceiling crisis. It's manufactured. The same way that the, we were always going to pay the debts that the United States had always already incurred, uh, but some people were raising doubts. They created a political firestorm. It encouraged the downgrade uh, in, in the eyes of some in one rating agency of United States debt. Uh, but we were, in fact, going to pay our bills, but it's possible to manufacture a crisis. Well, the post office uh, is facing a continuation of a theme that has plagued its existence Ever since Washington decided to trap the United States Postal Service between being a business and government control. Business demands government control. Back, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, when the Postal Service uh, ceased being a formal government agency, there were certain conditions that were negotiated. Uh, because for years, the post office was a government agency. The benefit, the public benefit that was recognized um, was taken into account. Uh, there's no question that the, that the post office um, provided subsidized mail service. Some people remember the, the three cent stamp. Uh, some people, uh, well, I guess there aren't many people who remember now, the Postal Service helped launch the aviation industry in this country in 1918 uh, when air mail service began between New York City and Washington, D.C. The post office was a part of uh, helping create that part of our infrastructure. The post office helped with the development of the Transcontinental Railroad Service uh, that served cities large and small. Um, there was a, a synergy that was involved there. Well, in 1970, the Post Office, um, uh, the Postal Reorganization Act, um, changed the Post Office from being a department of the federal government to being an independent agency. Um, it created a board of governors, it authorized the Postal Service to borrow from the public, and it phased out the government appropriation uh, for operations. And by 1982, 
that public benefit, that national connection, was entirely eliminated. Uh, there were also other items that were involved with that negotiation. At the time, there were hundreds of thousands of employees, past and current, who were part of a federal re employee retirement system uh, and its uh, successor uh, system uh, that, uh, that followed on in the 80s. Uh, their retirement was a responsibility of the federal government. It had been a responsibility for the federal government for over 180 years. Well, there was negotiations at that time about how much the Postal Service would have to pick up versus um, that in terms of that liability, even though it was a long-standing responsibility of the federal government and the way the post office operated. There was a very significant payment um, that uh, the new post office paid into the old retirement systems by virtue of employees who were federal employees. Well, you could make the argument that you wanted to completely privatize it and cut it loose, but that was a long-standing federal obligation. A deal was cut, a number was picked, um, and it was, I think, arguably, uh, a pretty generous deal on the part of the federal government, on the part of Congress, in terms of what they were forcing the post office to pay. It's not unlike what has happened more recently uh, when uh, the, uh, the post office um, has been required, unlike other businesses or government agencies, to pre-fund health payments for future employees. Tens of billions of dollars have been extracted from the postal service and current operations to deal with something that's going to be far in the future Something that, again, as I say, the, the federal government doesn't do, private employers don't do. Um, you can argue about how everybody would be better off if that happened. But it is creating, it's an example of creating an artificial crisis. And these tens of billions of dollars that have, were extracted in the early deal or the tens of billions of dollars that are now flowing because of the, the 2006 Act, um, have destabilized the Postal Service at a time that fairly, uh, I mean, it's, it's clear uh, that the Postal Office itself is, is stressed. Revenues have dropped for a variety of reasons. In part, there's e-commerce. There are a number of uh, things that we routinely now email that we would have mailed um, even a couple of years ago. And, of course, uh, with the the uh, bubble bursting in the economy, the ne it's near meltdown, uh, we have seen economic activity re uh, decline. So the post office has faced some $20 billion in lost revenue over the last four years. Um, and it's something that, in fact, needs to be addressed. But we ought to understand what the dynamic is. Um, that by forcing the post office to prefund its future health care payment benefits for the next 75 years in an astonishing 10-year time frame was something that was calculated to stress the Postal Service even if the economy hadn't collapsed. You know, without the provisions of that 2006 legislation, the Postal Service would be operating at a surplus even with the challenges today. Well, there are interesting pieces of legislation that is floating around. Um, uh, I'm, I must confess a little partial to uh, looking at uh, some of the uh, uh, proposals that are coming forward that would help take the post office off life support and allow us to move on to addressing these, these larger issues. Now, there are certain variations that Congress could have dealt with in the past. Policy questions. Should it cost the same to mail a letter uh, from here to the White House 
as it does from Key West to Nome, Alaska? Can we have some variability in pricing? That is a legitimate question. There may be some uh, arguments for doing that. Um, but uh, to, for the Congress over the years has hamstrung the post office. On one hand, arguing that it should not have public support, it should operate like a business, and then turning around and denying the Postal Service the flexibility that private business has in terms of, ra of setting rates, differential rates, um, it, it, um, in, in terms of moving into certain product lines. Um, in a, an enterprise that we value, that has this vast uh, infrastructure that is in place, hundreds of thousands of dedicated employees, over 30,000 locations, a tradition of service and connectivity to Americans six days a week, we would think that maybe give them a little opportunity to be creative. Well, uh, what we have found is that there is very little interest in allowing them to actually operate like a business. Um, I do hope that my colleagues, as they look at the reform proposals that are coming forward and look at uh, whether or not we're going to give them some flexibility to use the resources they already have and not uh, penalize them with uh, draconian and unrealistic um, requirements, take a look at what these proposals will have on rural and small town America. You know, not everybody Ha is, has access to high-speed internet um, that uh, make uh, email and reading your favorite magazine online uh, very difficult. Uh, there are 26.2 million Americans that still lack access to broadband services with over three quarters of those people living in rural areas. I mentioned that uh, in my state of Oregon, there are over 40 uh, post offices that are listed for possible closure. Um, people should think about those impacts. If you live, uh, over half of them are more of the people in these communities are located more than 10, mi uh, more than 10 miles from the next nearest post office. Some are as far as 33 miles away. Um, what are the impacts of having customers drive an hour round trip to visit the nearest post office? Is, is that reasonable? You know, it's, it's a little frustrating for me that as we have looked at some of these impacts, um, the attention that is paid to rural and small town America uh, has, has not been, uh, I think, given its due. One of the areas is the proposal of eliminating six-day service. Uh, let's consider how important Saturday mail delivery is for communication and marketing utilized by millions of citizens and mailers across the country, again, especially in rural areas. Uh, there are uh, millions of Americans now who are using the post service to deliver prescription medications, a service that relies on moving uh, the mail six days a week, not lying dormant uh, in mail processing facilities for two, three days, or depending on how holidays uh, uh, will fall, maybe longer. Um, it will have negative impacts um, in terms of being able to, uh, for people to be able to sign for packages if they're not home over the weekend. Uh, think about these details. Think about what's going to happen in, if you eliminate Saturday delivery for the postal, post office. Customers um, are likely to see private carriers pay uh, charge uh, much higher surcharges to have them deliver uh, that option or drive long distances to pick up their mail after renting out a private post office box for that purpose. Saturday service distinguishes the product line that we allow the Postal Service to have and, and I think um, uh, further diminishes their ability to be uh, 
uh, more self-supporting. Uh, and, of course, the eliminating the uh, six-day service is going to eliminate 80,000 uh, middle-class jobs. Um, there's, there's, uh, and they do so with some real question about how much of the saving is actually going to occur. The Postal Regulatory Commission was set up as part of this uh, mechanism uh, to establish an independent post office. Uh, they do some outstanding work. There are some really bright people. The Regulatory Commission found that the Postal Service has miscalculated the potential savings by about $1.4 billion a year when they talk about eliminating six-day service. Uh, they found that the Postal Service additionally failed to account for nearly half a billion in lost revenue that would come from cutting back Saturday service. And as the president of Hallmark noted in a congressional hearing last year, such reductions in service could lead to a death spiral where service reductions and a declining consumer base are self-reinforcing. The Postal Commission found that eliminating one day of mail service would cause 25% of all first class and priority mail to be delayed, often by two days. Uh, this has serious consequences that ought to be, um, I think, examined carefully before we move forward in this direction. This is not to suggest, Mr. Speaker, that the post office should be immune like any business or government agency, we all in these difficult times in changing circumstances need to consider new ways of doing business. And my conversations with people in the Postal Service, with the men and women who work there, postal supervisors, letter carriers, uh, clerks, um, the postmasters, um, they all have ideas. Uh, they all are interested in being part of a solution and I hope that Congress approaches this in the same fashion. Last but not least, part of this infrastructure that ties us together needs to be looked at in a broad context. We've all been deeply concerned about national security in the aftermath of 9-11. The anthrax situation we've had here. Potential pandemics uh, that, uh, where there are health crises. How are we going to deal with people quickly in times of need to get them information, to check on people, to distribute uh, potential medicines? You know, the Postal Service, with two-thirds of a million employees, a nationwide network of over 30 facilities, people who have equipment, who have know-how, knowledge of the community, the same way they help people with the right tax forms or immigration, could also be a resource in time of natural disaster, epidemic, or terrorism. Let's think big. Let's think fairly. Let's not have an artificial crisis. Let's deal meaningfully with this critical resource that America has developed over the last 235 years, not scapegoat the employees, not scapegoat the management, and have Congress be able to have it both ways, saying treat it like a business, but not giving them the flexibility. I think it's time to take a deep breath, look at the resource and what it means for America, particularly rural and small town. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to share some observations on this important topic.